Okay, I'd like to welcome everybody to Pediatric Grand Rounds, and I'm going to turn it over to our Vice Chair for Medical Education, Dr. Sandrine Van Sheik, to introduce our speaker today. Good afternoon, everybody. It's my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Fernando Gonzalez. Uh, he's a professor of pediatrics in the Division of Neonatology, the co-director of the Neurointensive Care Nursery, and the director of the Pediatric Molecular Medicine Pathway at UCSF. He obtained his Bachelor of Science degree in Neuroscience, as well as his MD at Brown University. He completed his pediatric residency at Harbor at UCLA before coming here to UCSF for Neonatology Fellowship. And since 2007, he's been on the faculty and he has been continuously funded by the NEH for basic science, translational and clinical research. The aims of his research program are to understand the mechanism of injury and repair after full-term brain injury, specifically delayed treatment strategies to enhance neuroprotective pathways after neonatal stroke and hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy. And when we asked uh, Dr. Gonzalez to tell us a little bit more about how he got to this path, he said that he had always had a strong interest in medically indicated fertility preservation and in the pediatric population. He almost pursued a fellowship in adolescent gynecology before deciding on reproductive endocrinology. He took care of his first transgender patient in the first few years as an attending. And realized Wait, hold up. I think you're, right. uh, you're reading something else. I was just saying that this doesn't make any sense. I am sorry. Yeah. I don't no know worries. where it came from. You got to tell us. I'm like, this doesn't make any sense. I didn't know any of this about you. Sorry, Fernando. I think we got um, uh, no worries. copy and pasting here. Tell us how you got interested in newborn brain. Well, I'll, I'll talk about it in my talk today. But up until that last paragraph, I'd say that's pretty accurate. Really just trying to repair the newborn brain after injury. Can you actually, I'm sharing my slides now. Can you see my slides? Yes. Okay. I'll, okay. I'll go ahead and get started. Thank you for the kind introduction. And also to the... Uh, committee for inviting me to speak today. So today I am gonna focus on full-term brain injury and neonates and really how we, uh, focusing on how we model full-term injury and really what we can do to repair the brain and improve long-term outcomes. Um, sorry, I'm just gonna move my, change my screen here a little bit. So I'm gonna begin by discussing the different causes of injury and the terminology that we use for full-term brain injury, as well as the different phases of injury progression and repair. And I'm going to start with the only current therapeutic option that we have for full-term infants, infants after perinatal brain injury, and that's therapeutic hypothermia or whole body cooling <clears throat> and the evidence for that. Then I'm going to discuss some other treatment strategies um, that may be used in the future, using that as an opportunity to talk in more detail about the different small and large animal models that we used to study acute and delayed treatment strategies. And I'm going to finish by discussing therapeutic options for low resource settings and how our treatment strategies may differ in those environments. So first, the terminology. So when a newborn presents with an abnormal neurological exam and a concern for hypoxic or ischemic hit to the brain, they're presenting with neonatal encephalopathy. The term that was used for many years is birth asphyxia, um, but that's a little bit outdated. And some uh, providers say that um, babies are presenting with hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy when they present with an abnormal neurological exam. Now, the reality is we don't necessarily know the cause of their encephalopathy until we do imaging and uh, other uh, uh, and monitoring uh, to determine the underlying cause. So really the most accurate description is that they're presenting with neonatal encephalopathy. Now, having said that, the two most common causes of neonatal encephalopathy in full-term infants are hypo hypoxia ischemia and stroke. And so I'm going to differentiate these two on the next slide. But once again, there's many causes of an abnormal neurological exam in a full-term newborn. And later, I'm going to detail how we try to determine early on who may benefit from neuroprotective or neuroreparative strategies. So once again, the most common cause of perinatal brain injury in full-term infants um, is hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy, or AHIE. And the second one is stroke. So I'm going to go through the numbers here. HIE is the most common, occurring in as many as six in every 1,000 live births. And it results from a global reduction of blood flow and oxygen delivery to the brain. And it leads to different patterns of injury based on the severity or the duration of the insult. Now, stroke is also very common with an incidence of approximately one in 2,000 live births. So that's similar to the incidence that's seen in adult stroke. And this causes a more focal injury pattern where there's a core of cell necrosis. This is uh, surrounded by a penumbra of damaged cells. 
Um, and following tissue reperfusion, so where blood flow is restored, um, those cells in the surrounding penumbra um, are then at risk for secondary energy failure and programmed cell death pathways. And this also results in alterations in cell fate, including neurogenesis and angiogenesis. And I'm gonna go through that in a little bit. Now, arterial ischemic stroke is by far the most common cause of stroke in the perinatal period, occurring in around 80% of uh, cases. And the cause is multifactorial, but for both HIE and stroke, it's thought to often occur in the context of placental disease or infection or with fetal distress. So something that causes, for example, a clot to be thrown, creating an occlusive thrombus, which then clears and this, once again, results in reperfusion injury in different program cell death pathways as injury progresses. And, and an important point is that the recognition of hypoxic or ischemic injury is often delayed. So we also need to identify delayed treatment strategies that not only re reduce ongoing injury, but enhance long-term repair. Now, I'm going to return to this at the end, but since I'm talking about the numbers, the incidence that I gave is more representative of high resource settings. In low and middle income countries, there's a much higher incidence of neonatal encephalopathy and early brain injury and full term infants with a profound impact on long term child health. So, we do not need to identify feasible treatment strategies to improve outcomes in these settings. So, now let me talk about injury progression following ischemia reperfusion injury, which occurs in both HIE and stroke. So, an important point is that the injury is not a single event but it's an evolving process. And it includes primary, secondary, and tertiary phases of injury. And there's a brief latent phase that separates the primary and secondary phase. And I'm gonna go through that. So when there's an initial interruption of blood flow or oxygen delivery to the brain or a portion of the brain, first there's primary cell death. So this is where decreased oxygen and nutrient availability results in failure of aerobic metabolism and inability to maintain cell membrane functions and then eventual cell necrosis. So this is accompanied by later leakage of excitotoxic amino acids, free radical production, lipid peroxidation, all things that lead to progression of injury. Now, during this latent phase, this is the early reperfusion phase. So blood flow and oxygen delivery restored. There may be some initial recovery of those damaged cells that haven't died yet, but many of those cells end up dying hours later or during this period of secondary energy failure. So reperfusion eventually leads to a burst of free radical production, inflammatory mediators, and several events that lead to failure of mitochondrial activity and programmed cell death pathways. And so for this reason, the timing of recognition and response to injury is critical. Treating infants prior to these later phases of injury can help protect or salvage themselves from further damage. Um, now, one more point about the terminology that we use. So often we describe neuroprotection, and we use that term rather broadly. But what we're really describing, and what we hope to find, is therapeutic strategies that do help protect the brain from damage by preventing it in the early stages, but also salvaging those damaged cells in the penumbra from death in the latent and secondary phases. But finally, repairing the brain by enhancing cell proliferation, migration, and function in the tertiary phase. And so really our goal is to find a therapy or combination of therapies that address multiple mechanisms of injury progression and repair to then improve long-term function. So these figures are taken from slightly older papers, but I'm using them to demonstrate a point of how difficult it is to translate preclinical findings to the clinical realm. So this is specific to neuroprotection experiments in stroke, where you can see the number, the increase in neuroprotection trials over decades. The bottom one shows here shows the degree of neuroprotection in animal models based on the class or the mechanism of the drug being studied. Now, this figure on top uh, demonstrates a scoring system for determining the most promising preclinical therapies for HIE that should be studied um, in clinical trials, where the scope of testing um, is here on the y-axis, so 10 being um, quite a bit of testing has been done in multiple models and multiple types of injury. On the x-axis is the degree of neuroprotection. And a few of these are labeled here. Hypothermia is up here, and erythropoietin is also up here somewhere. And this table um, shows us, uh, uh, makes a similar point. It's really a scoring system um, for the most promising therapies for neonatal HIE. These include EPO and melatonin, stem cells, and other things that I'm going to talk about uh, today. So when I say the most promising therapies in preclinical studies, what does that mean exactly? It's not just the number of studies or reproducibility, but it also means doing it in both small and large animal models and having a large N. So 
There are small and large animal models of brain injury, so I'm going to discuss them briefly throughout the talk, but I've roughly subdivided them here into lysencephalic brains and gyroencephalic brains. So lysencephalic means a relatively smooth surface lacking significant sulci. So this includes both mice and rats, which are used most commonly. And I'm going to discuss those models in the next slide. So for that, we use postnatal day 10 or P10 rats um, or mice, because we consider that closest in development to a full-term human newborn. But obviously, the brains are different. Rabbits are used more commonly in preemie injury models for cerebral palsy, guinea pigs, sometimes for models of fetal growth restriction. Now, gyroencephalic brains, in contrast, have deeper folding with gyri and sulci. So they're considered more similar to human brains. <clears throat> so here in this image, it compares a P7 mouse to a P5 piglet to an infant human brain, where you can see the distinction in the outward appearance. For large animal models, I'm going to mention piglet, sheep, and um, non-human primate. Um, non-human primate is rare due to high cost and ethical issues, but these are examples of some of the types of, of injury models used um, in, for larger animals, for both preterm and full-term infants. Um, most commonly for these large animal models, what, what they do is they uh, perform umbilical cord occlusion just prior to delivery, um, followed by resuscitation. And uh, so that's most commonly used for the larger animals, um, which I'm gonna discuss. But a critical point is that you do have to study these therapies in more than one species and include large animals to really assess complex behaviors in recovery. Beyond that, it's not just histologic outcomes, but long-term functional behavioral outcomes and the need to be powered to examine sex-specific differences. So I'm gonna discuss the models, the mouse and rat models that we use in our lab. I'm gonna go through this fairly quickly, but um, just to give you context for the later studies that I'm going to present. So the model that's more commonly used and that more people are familiar with to simulate hypoxic ischemic injury is the rice Venucci model, or simply referred to as the Venucci model. And I don't have images of that here, but in that model, the common carotid artery is ligated on one side permanently. After brief recovery, the animal is placed in the hypoxic chamber for a certain amount of time, and that leads to injury. Now there can be quite a bit of variability in injury pattern between animals, between litters or strains. So you need a relatively high N. Also the way that that injury occurs where there's permanent occlusion of a carotid, then later hypoxia isn't necessarily what's happening in human infants, but it does result in a fairly consistent injury pattern. Now what we use in the lab um, is a focal ischemia reperfusion model of injury that was um, developed by Nikita Derugin. And so this is transient um, occlusion and then reperfusion, referred to as middle cerebral artery occlusion, or MCAO. And that's shown in the images here. So here there's a physical obstruction of blood flow via an occluder that is advanced up the internal carotid artery until it obstructs the MCA. And it's left there for a fixed amount of time, after which that occluder is removed and blood flow is restored. So resulting in reperfusion. So reperfusion, as I mentioned, is a critical part of injury progression. And so even though this is focal injury pattern, we feel may be a relatively accurate representation of the different phases of injury that are occurring in humans and also relevant when extrapolating to HIE. So Mara Davis is a specialist in our lab performing that. <clears throat> so I'm gonna come back to those animal models to discuss the preclinical evidence for different therapies. But I do wanna start by discussing the only current post-injury treatment that we have, and that's therapeutic hypo hypothermia. And a really important point about hypothermia is that it needs to be initiated early prior to the latent period and the period of secondary energy failure. And earlier initiation is more effective. So there's, there's quite a bit of preclinical evidence in both small and large animal models showing the benefit of either dedicated head or total body cooling and improving outcomes. This is just an example of some of the early trials. Similarly, when you look at the trials in human neonates, Either head or total body cooling is effective in reducing the combined outcome of death or moderate to severe neurodevelopmental disability at two years of age, with a number needed to treat of about seven. Now, some important points about how we do this here at UCSF. So first, you need to start cooling by six hours of age. And the earlier, the earlier you cool, the better they do, which I'm gonna show next. So we do whole body cooling, like most places, because it's easier than just cooling the head. And it enables EEG monitoring for background activity and seizure activity, um, which is important because these babies are at risk for seizures. So we cool to 33 and a half degrees Celsius for 72 hours, which is about 92 degrees Fahrenheit, after which they're slowly rewarmed and we obtain an MRI. 
And a number of our cooled babies are born in outside hospitals. So we do initiate cooling and transport with a portable cooling device, because as I mentioned, timing is critical. And so this makes that point. So we need to initiate by six hours. And really that time point was determined in a sheet model of HIE by Alistair Gunn's group in New Zealand. And I'm gonna show some of his research. Um, and they initially studied um, different temperatures, different length of cooling, um, different starting point for cooling. Um, and basically they found that earlier initiation is better, but that you really had to start it by about five and a half hours of life. But it was really those studies that informed the clinical trials. Now this is actually taken from one of the clinical trials. Um, uh, showing motor outcomes in survivors. And basically it shows that um, uh, the earlier you initiate cooling, the better the outcome. So if it was before three hours, they had better outcomes than between three and six hours. So I do also wanna talk about two other issues regarding our current neonatal management as it relates to cooling and brain injury. So first is identifying those who may actually benefit from cooling. So as I mentioned, we need to cool early and earlier is better, but we don't always know who may have brain injury or may, who, who may benefit from cooling or potentially these other therapies that I'm gonna talk about. So we have to make a relatively quick decision about cooling um, and we have to do our best with the information that we have. So we, we do use several different criteria to identify those babies with possible early brain injury. So first they have to be term or near term. Second, they have to have encephalopathy or presence of an abnormal neurological exam. And we use a modified SARNET exam for that. And then we use either metabolic or resuscitation criteria, such, such as a poor cord gas or initial baby gas or prolonged resuscitation or low APGARS. Obviously, uh, EEG monitoring and MRI would let us know who, who may have suffered an earlier injury, but we don't have that information early on. So once again, we have to do our best to make sure that we identify who may have suffered brain injury. Now, the second point about hypothermia is that it works. It reduces death or moderate to severe neurodevelopmental impairment quite significantly. Once again, with the number needed to treat of about seven. <clears throat> but you can, still, there's still, you can see there's still significant injury and poor outcomes in many babies. So we do need to find other strategies to hopefully further improve outcomes. And once again, not every baby has HIE. It could be something else, or they may be identified outside that six hour window. So perhaps we can find other therapeutic options for this. Uh, patients. So <clears throat> I mentioned hypothermia works. There's been a number of studies to optimize cooling because once again, there's still quite a few babies that have poor outcomes. So I mentioned it was Ellis de Gunn's sheet model that first clearly showed the benefit. They also looked at deeper cooling to a lower temperature, longer cooling, and altered rewarming, but saw no benefit in their animal models. Now for clinical trials, deeper, longer cooling was also examined. And there was actually increased mortality in those babies who underwent deeper and longer cooling. Later cooling, so outside the six hour window between six and 24 hours uh, was also studied. It was found to be safe, but it was not clearly efficacious. And now for premature babies who present with encephalopathy, we don't know if cooling is effective. Similarly with babies with more mild encephalopathy, we don't know if cooling is effective. So those studies are ongoing. Okay, so once again, when we look at the mechanism of injury progression and these different therapies to target these different pathways, we've just discussed hypothermia. The next therapy that has shown a lot of promise in preclinical studies is erythropoietin or EPO. Now, EPO is a growth factor that has a number of roles in addition to erythropoiesis, and it also has protective and reparative effects in different uh, models of brain injury. So EPO and its receptor are expressed by a variety of different cell types in the central nervous system during normal development, but their expression is increased uh, during hypoxia via upstream regulation by neuronal transcription factor, hypoxia-inducible factor one and two. And so it has specific early effects in reducing apoptosis and inflammation and later effects in increasing angiogenesis and neurogenesis. Um, so I'm not gonna show some of the um, the mechanistic work looking at the cell type specific effects, but just to mention it here, what we did initially was um, in our neonatal ischemia reperfusion model, we gave a single large dose of EPO, 5,000 units per kilogram immediately after injury. We saw a short term increase in brain volume and also neurogenesis and oligodendrocyte precursors and reduced astrocytic scarring. However, when we repeated the experiment and gave that single large dose, but waited until the rats reached adulthood to perform a, a battery of cognitive and sensory motor tests. 
there was no long-term improvement. So meaning no difference between that single large dose given right after injury in untreated animals at the later time point. But once again, since EPO has multiple functions, including later neurogenic and angiogenic effects, and different cells produce EPO and EPO receptor at later time points after ischemia, we gave multiple doses of EPO, three doses over a one week period. And with this treatment regimen, we saw that there was a significant improvement in hemispheric brain volume after the rats reached adulthood. And there was improved cognitive and sensory motor function. So dem really demonstrating the importance of the timing of the doses and specifically the later doses. So even though the cumulative dose three times 1,000 was less than the 5,000 we gave immediately after injury. So once again, EPO has early effects on inflammation and apoptosis, later effects on neurogenesis and angiogenesis and repair. And we needed to give dosing over a week to show long-term benefit. What if we just gave it at the later time points? So we repeated the experiment in a separate cohort of rats. Once again, P10 ischemia reperfusion injury. And we gave three doses of EPO over a one week period um, but we waited seven days to initiate that treatment. So a delayed treatment strategy. So we found that even with this delayed tr treatment strategy, there was a significant improvement in the EPO treated relative to the vehicle treated animals and hemispheric brain volume, as well as short-term sensory motor performance. So now another therapy that has shown, and I'm gonna shift away from EPO and talk about another therapy, but I'm gonna bring them back together afterwards. So the other therapy that has shown potential is a late treatment strategy. Um, for early ischemia reperfusion injury in HIE stem cells. <clears throat> now, um, stem cell is a pretty broad term. And so that can mean a lot of different things. And I'm, I'm not gonna go through this in detail, but I wanna show some of the published and ongoing trials using stem cells for HIE in different animal models um, and, and different sources that include human and cord cells, animal cells, and different types of neuronal stem cells. So in addition to the various sources of cells, um, there's different doses, there's different timing, there's different route of administration. So all of these need to be clarified to optimize this therapy. So while stem cells have shown promise um, in animal models of brain injury, how do they work exactly? So the work that we do in the lab, um, we use mesenchymal stem cells or MSCs. So these are minimally invasive, low immunogenicity, they contain multiple regenerative or protective abilities across different tissues. So MSCs have been shown to improve neurological outcomes in different models of brain injury. <clears throat> the interesting thing is that in many studies of stem cells in the CNS, the cells don't survive long-term. So they get injected or administered, and regardless of the method used to track them, for the most part, they die off, um, but yet there's still benefit. So MSCs secrete a number of factors that stimulate angiogenesis, neurogenesis, white matter remodeling, the things we think about when we think about repair. And it's really thought that these paracrine effects underlie the benefits seen with stem cells and not direct cell replacement. In addition, in some animal models of uh, CNS disease, MSCs have also been genetically modified to produce spe specific growth factors, which may have some additional benefit. <clears throat> So Cindy Van Veltoven, when she was a postdoc here at UCSF with Donna Ferrero, showed that delayed administration of MSCs um, improved outcomes. So, so P10 ischemia reperfusion injury, then three days later, intranasal MSCs were administered and improved short-term brain volumes, and it also improved sensory motor performance. Also genetically modifying the MSCs to produce BDNF may have had a subtle additional uh, functional benefit. So discussing, you know, when I mentioned altering or enhancing stem cells to further improve that beneficial response. Interestingly, MSCs express EPO receptor, and recent evidence shows that EPO can drive a pro-angiogenesis program in MSCs. Also, EPO-activated MSCs, so where MSCs are pre-exposed to EPO before administration, appears to enhance the trophic role of these stem cells in different injury models. Specifically, in immature brain injury models, intranasal administration of MSCs that were hypoxia preconditioned. So they were, they were exposed to hypoxia to increase HIF expression and downstream growth factor expression that improved angiogenesis and functional outcomes after neonatal rat MCAO. Systemic injection of hypoxia preconditioned cells also improved outcomes after rat hypoxia ischemia. And once again, delayed administration of MSC. So in this, this study by Cho et al., they performed P10 mouse hypoxic ischemic injury. Then they waited six weeks to administer MSCs. 
And they found that even with that delayed administration, there was improved angiogenesis and functional outcomes. So I will also add that this isn't the point of the talk, but since we think that the paracrine effect um, underlies that benefit that we see, um, other groups have demonstrated benefit of administering simply the MSC culture medium. So even in the absence of the cells that the secreted factors can improve outcomes. And a number of groups are looking uh, specifically at secreted exosomes as a treatment strategy. So then our goal then with our more recent work was to take MSCs, which have shown some benefit for delay with delayed intranasal administration and to treat them in such a way that maybe we can enhance that reparative response. So hypothesizing that um, a combination strategy that pre-exposes MSCs to EPO would further enhance long-term repair and function and possibly increase the therapeutic window for treatment. So to be clear, um, once again, this is P10, is uh, ischemia reperfusion injury. Comparing standard MSCs given intranasally as we've done before, comparing that to MSCs pre-exposed to EPO for 24 hours in culture, after which the EPO is washed out and just the cells are administered. So we do, we did that at three days in a cohort of rats. We did it three days after a stroke. Um, and also compared that to three dose systemic EPO started at that same time point, which we'd previously published. Then in so separate cohorts of rats, they're just treated at seven days. So more delayed treatment strategy. We then waited until the rats reached adulthood um, and did behavioral and histologic analyses. So to briefly summarize, <clears throat> we found that the delayed treatment at either three days or seven days resulted in histologic improvement with all three of the treat treatment groups. So here we have media treated, MCAO, uh, standard MSCs, MSCs pre-exposed to EPO and three dose systemic EPO. Uh, one of these lines represents three day treatment and the other one represents seven day treatment. So you can see both, all three treatment groups were effective at either three days or seven days. Once again, you can't just do histology. You have to determine if there's long-term functional efficacy following these delayed treatment strategies. <clears throat> Excuse me. So for cognitive testing, we use novel object recognition to examine recognition, memory, memory and learning. <laughs> now I won't go through this in too much detail, but it really assesses the rat's ability to learn and recognize familiar objects over a length of time. Then during the testing trial, a novel object is placed and their intrinsic drives to investigate novel objects. But if they haven't learned what the standard objects are, they'll spend an equal amount of time with these two objects. And that's what we see here. So here in the, in the vehicle treated animals, they spend 50% of the time um, examining the two objects when we calculated this novel object preference index. There was a subtle improvement with standard MSCs, but it was not significant. But there was significant improvement in the MSCs pre-exposed to EPO and three dose systemic EPO. Now this is three day treatment. But at seven days, we found the same thing, an improvement only in the MSCs pre-exposed to EPO and the three-dose systemic EPO. Now, we also used open field testing to investigate anxiety and exploratory behavior. So basically, rats, when they're placed in a new open environment, um, you can calculate um, their, or you can determine their anxiety by measuring their locomotion and exploratory behavior. And injured animals, generally have more anxiety and explore less. And so there's a lot going on here, but I'm just gonna summarize it. That basically we saw no improvement in anxiety or exploratory behavior in adulthood with either stem cell based treatment, with either standard MSCs or MSCs pre-exposed to EPO. But we saw an improvement with the three dose systemic EPO in all the measures of anxiety and exploratory behavior. So a reminder, once again, for histology, we saw significant improvement in each of these treated groups with treatment in seven days. So once again, it's indicative of the disconnect we sometimes see between histology and function. And while they're frequently closely associated, they're not necessarily associated. And we've seen that in a number of studies. And so to summarize, each therapy had some benefit, but three dose systemic EPO seemed to have the most long-term functional benefit. And so EPO may represent a common pathway for repair and not simply gross histologic repair, but cell type specific effects and pathways that improve, improve circuit formation and function. So now I'm gonna bring this back to um, stem cells, um, just to mention the clinical trials that have been completed or ongoing. And there's quite a few, as you can see here. On the next slide, I'm gonna summarize a few of the relevant ones. Um, but this is used to demonstrate the stage, uh, a number of things in re regarding stem cell trials. First, the stage of these different trials, where you can see there's a number that are unpublished. The, the cell source, 
the cell type, um, the number of cells that are administered. So once again, there's a lot of questions that remain to be answered to optimize stem cell therapy. And really, we need to determine if there's long-term efficacy of stem cells or with stem cells combined with another therapy. So here's a few examples. So these first two, this top one is from Duke. The second one is from China. They're giving early stem cells, autologous stem cells that are harvested at the time of delivery in combination with cooling for HIE. And so these are ongoing studies. Now, the third trial here on the bottom here is um, for babies diagnosed with neonatal stroke during the first week of life by MRI, they're administered intranasal MSCs. And this just came out in the Lancet. So this was a safety trial in a small number of babies, but basically a very similar protocol to what we did in our rat model. So now stem cells may work and we know hypothermia works and it's now standard of care for babies with encephalopathy, but do we know if they're safe together? or if there's really any added benefit to combining those two therapies. Now, there are relatively few preclinical studies examining this combination strategy. The first examined early MS, the, from the top here, early MSCs in combination with hypothermia, and they found additional benefit to combination therapy over either alone. The same group um, gave MSCs at a slightly later time point, and similarly showed that combined therapy was better than either alone. Now, for both of these, these are P7 rat hypoxia ischemia. Now, a different group um, performing P9 hypoxia ischemia, um, so closer to what we consider term, P7 is probably closer to a 32-weeker. So they found that each individual therapy had benefit. So hypothermia improved motor outcomes, MSCs improved cognitive outcomes, but combination therapy actually resulted in worse outcomes. And when they investigated, they found increased inflammatory markers and reduced downstream production of growth factors with combined therapy. So obviously this is a cause for concern because most if not all of these babies will be cooled clinically. So further testing is obviously necessary. And now this group um, in Nikki Robertson's group in London is studying this and other therapies more closely in her piglet HIE model. So now, sorry, I don't mean to give you whiplash, but I'm gonna pivot back from stem cells and talk about clinical trials with EPO. And the reason I'm kind of doing it in this format is I really wanna contrast the amount of pre-existing evidence that we have for these two different therapies. So I've alluded to this in previous slides, but really few of any potential therapies have the supporting preclinical evidence that EPO does for brain injury, in both small and large animal models. And they're very consistently shown improvement. Importantly, few of them are in combination with hypothermia, so I'm gonna discuss that. But we've used EPO clinically for decades in our unit for treatment of anemia of prematurity in premature neonates. So we feel fairly comfortable with its safety profile. We haven't really seen any of the adverse events associated with chronic use in adults. So for adults, it's free, it was frequently given for um, uh, in, uh, chemotherapy associated with malignancy or with kidney disease. And so for the studies we're talking about for HIE or stroke, it's just a few doses of EPO. But in the studies with more chronic use in neonates, once again, from, uh, primarily for anemia prematurity or in clinical trials of preemie neuroprotection, there haven't been any concerning complications. I mentioned there haven't been a whole lot of combination EPO plus hypothermia preclinical studies. I do wanna call out one by Chris Trout and Sunny Jules group at the University of Washington. So they used a non-human primate model of HIE to study combination therapy with EPO and hypothermia. So in this model, macaque monkeys are delivered following 15 to 18 minutes of umbilical cord occlusion. Then the resuscitation, they're resuscitated and randomized to saline only, so the vehicle treatment, hypothermia only, or hypothermia combined with four doses of EPO over the first week. Um, the uh, animals are then followed to nine months of age. They do motor assessments in an MRI. So basically they found that in this model, umbilical cord occlusion resulted in death or moderate to severe cerebral palsy in 43% of the saline treated animals. 44% of the hypothermia animals, which is interesting, but 0% of the hypothermia plus EPO treated animals at nine months of age. Um, and they also found some benefit in uh, the MRI measures of entry, which I don't show. I do wanna make one point. You can see the number of animals in each group here. So there were a total of 35 animals. So not a ton, but at least this was a promising finding. So now moving on to the clinical trials, examining the combination therapy of EPO with hypothermia. So Yvonne Wu is a child neurologist here at UCSF that many of you know. So she conducted this phase one trial of EPO in combination with hypothermia. 
in babies with suspected um, who present with neonatal encephalopathy and suspected HIE injury. And so this is a safety trial where cool babies received multiple doses of EPO every other day for up to two weeks with the first dose given within 24 hours of age at these different doses. Basically, she found that it was safe, there were no adverse events, and that a dose of 1,000 units per kilogram resulted in plasma EPO levels that most closely approximated the neuroprotective levels in different small and large animal models in Sunny Jules group. Once again, this is the same dose that resulted in long-term improvement in our ischemia reperfusion rat model. So using this information, she then proceeded to a phase two trial at seven centers. So this is a blinded placebo control trial using this dose of EPO or placebo, five doses within that first week. Um, the, uh, the babies underwent MRI following cooling and 12 month outcomes were assessed. So this is a feasibility trial. So really to see if this can be done before pursuing a phase three efficacy trial. So it wasn't actually powered to show efficacy with only 50 babies total. However, even with these small numbers, there was a significant improvement in both MRI findings shown here. We can see in the EPO group, there's a significant uh, reduction in MRI global injury score. And there was improved motor outcomes in the EPO group. Now, once again, this is 12 months and it's, prime, you know, it, it's not a great assessment. Um, uh, in addition, in the placebo group, there were two kids who had brain malformations that could explain their initial encephalopathy and poor outcome. And so when you remove those, it was no longer significant. However, these findings were still promising. So this led to the phase three HEAL trial. So Avon Wu and Sunny Jewel are the PIs for this trial. And in this trial, 500 babies were enrolled at 17 academic centers nationwide over about two and a half years. And for this, the primary outcome is two-year neurodevelopment with secondary outcomes of safety, early MRI findings, and serum and urine biomarkers of injury. Now, the protocol is shown here. Once again, babies greater than 36 weeks gestational age with moderate or severe encephalopathy that are undergoing cooling are eligible. And they received five doses of EPO, 1,000 units per kilogram, or placebo over that first week, the first dose administered within the first 24 hours of life. MRIs performed following cooling and rewarming. Once again, the primary outcome is the two-year neurodevelop neurodevelopment. So um, Bailey 3, a neuro exam, and other measures of motor and behavioral outcomes. Also to be clear, due to pandemic restrictions on outpatient follow-up, specifically for clinical research studies, the window for evaluation was extended. So 25% of survivors were evaluated at 26 to 36 months, as opposed to the 22 to 26 months that were originally planned. And so here's a breakdown of the follow-up. So there were 500 cooled babies. Importantly, they were also stratified by severity of encephalopathy, and I'll talk about why that's important. So these babies were randomized to either the EPO group or the placebo group. Um, and 93% of babies in the EPO group and 91% of babies in the placebo group completed assessment of the primary outcome. Okay, so now I'm gonna go through the results of the primary outcome. So showing first this four plot. So, hold on, I lost my cursor here. On the top here on the left, you can see um, the outcomes of death, any neurodevelopmental impairment, and breakdown of a Bailey cognitive less than 90, cerebral palsy, or any abnormal motor outcome. On the, broad, on the bottom of the breakdown by severity of encephalopathy, um, as well as breakdown by sex. And so the main, and so really the conclusion, the main finding, if you look at this, is that there's no difference between EPO and placebo in the outcome in cooled babies. I don't show the MRI outcomes, but similarly, we saw no difference between EPO and placebo. As anticipated, about half of our study population had death or neurodevelopmental impairment at age two. I do also want to briefly mention um, one other thing, and that's the incidence of um, serious adverse events in the two treatment groups. So we defined in SAE as any of these nine potentially serious complications of HIE, including a few complications described in adults receiving chronic EPO. Importantly, these pre-specified SAEs were at any time, including those that occurred before the administration of study drugs. So we saw no difference in the, um, in the two treatment groups and the frequency of any SAE when you looked at it individually. However, when, they're analyzed, when they were analyzed in aggregate, the average number of serious adverse events per subject was higher in the EPO group than the placebo group. Um, so I'm going to talk about uh, my, the conclusions here and then, and then mention a few things. So one, 
you know, combined EPO and hypothermia was not effective. And once again, this is a study that had 500 babies with greater than 90% follow-up. So while that's disappointing, it's conclusive. To mention this again, there's, there are few of any things that had the preclinical evidence that EPO did for full-term brain injury, although not that many combined EPO and hypothermia. And the potential safety issues are surprising and a little bit concerning if they're real. We're investigating that further, but there are a few potential explanations for our findings. But at, at this point, it's all speculative, but I'll, I'm gonna mention a few things. So Sunny Jewel demonstrated in different animal models of HIE that there's a U-shaped response curve to EPO. So meaning if they got too little EPO, it, it didn't work. And then that mid range was effective, but doses that were too high resulted in worse outcomes. So we also know that following acute injury in the brain, there's endogenous EPO production as a result. Um, and that's well described. And so perhaps adding exogenous EPO at that time point is too much and it could be deleterious as opposed to just giving later doses to enhance repair. I do also wanna mention another study that actually took, uh, it was in Paris and it took place before EPO and it was called the NeuroEPO study. Um, and it combined EPO and hypothermia for moderate to severe encephalopathy. And as far as I'm aware, uh, they haven't published the results. And so what we know about it is from abstract presentations uh, and direct communications, but I believe they plan to enroll 300 babies, but they were stopped after interim analysis of 100 babies because there was increased mortality in the EPO group. It turns out they didn't stratify by severity of encephalopathy, and there were more severely encephalopathic babies in the EPO hypothermia group. So basically sicker babies in the EPO group. And so the belief is because there were sicker babies, the mortality was higher, but we don't know that for sure. But now we have this large cohort of babies and we're looking at a number of different things, including biomarkers of injury, placental histology, blood glucose, and other lab values. And Hannah Glass is the PI of an EEG study correlating EEG background and seizure activity to MRI and long-term outcomes. And now this last comment here may seem obvious after what I just presented, but let me tell you a number of places in this country and internationally are already giving EPO in combination with hypothermia in their units based on the phase two trial results. So I mentioned possible reasons why it didn't work. I mean, we do know timing of these different interventions is critical. So an example of a therapy with surprising worse outcomes in animal models is VEGF. So VEGF is a growth factor, also downstream of HIF. It promotes angiogenesis. Um, uh, and if you give it later, three days after ischemia reperfusion injury in mice and rats, it improves repair and outcomes. But if you give it early on acutely within hours of the insult, they actually have worse outcomes. It increases blood brain permeability and it increases edema. It's indicative of the importance of timing. Now this study that I'm showing here is uh, once again from Alistair Gunn's uh, sheet model. And so they were performing this trial while the HEAL trial was ongoing. And what they were trying to do is really examine mechanisms of repair with combined EPO and hypothermia treatment, focusing on the cell type specific effects in different regions of the brain. But the bottom line is they couldn't get EPO to work. There was no additive benefit when giving simultaneously with hypothermia. And they theorized that they may be, they may be working by similar mechanisms. And so maybe when it comes to EPO or stem cells or these other therapies that we need to focus either on monotherapy or delayed treatment to enhance these later reparative mechanisms. So I'm not going to go through this, but just to mention that there's several EPO-based trials and combination trials of hypothermia plus other therapies uh, that are ongoing in similar populations to the one I just presented or slightly different populations, such as with milder injury or stroke or in premature infants. But now I'm going to pivot to discuss early brain care in low resource settings. So once again, we know hypothermia is effective here but it takes experience and expertise. And there's a relatively narrow temperature range with benefit. As I mentioned, there were deeper, longer cooling, they did worse. Or if babies, when they're rewarmed, ever get febrile, then um, they do worse. So you have to do it right and it takes experience. So is this feasible to do this in low and middle income countries? So this summarizes um, small trials with, with relatively few babies that suggested the benefit of cooling in low resource settings. Now, this led to the HELIX trial, which is a hypothermia for moderate or severe, severe neonatal encephalopathy in low and middle income countries. Um, and to be clear, at the centers where they did this, they did cooling similar to what we do here, and they did MRI and they had follow-up. Um, uh, but disappointingly, 
it provided evidence of the harm of cooling in these environments. There was actually increased mortality um, in the hypothermia group with the number needed to harm of nine. And there was a lack of neuroprotection, obviously. So we need to work on finding therapeutic strategies that are gonna work in these environments. And maybe we can refashion or take current therapies that have shown promise as monotherapies or as later therapies and use this in other environments. An important point is the cost of the therapy and also storage of that therapy. Now I've talked about a few of the things on the slide already, but I'm gonna mention um, a few more studies and models that are being used with a focus on low resource settings. And this may be also where repurposing drugs may provide the quickest route from bench to bedside. And so this is gonna be a little bit of a lightning round. I'm gonna go through this quickly, but just to mention some of the studies that are ongoing. So the first is melatonin. So this has several protective mechanisms. And in animal models, it, it works, you know, Sorry, the protective mechanisms include being a free radical scavenger, it's anti-apoptotic, anti-inflammatory. And it's been shown to be uh, effective both with and without hypothermia in animal models and uh, relatively safe. So now Nikki Robertson's group um, is using her piglet model um, of HIE to study dose, timing, and efficacy both with and without hypothermia. Another therapy um, that's being studied is allopurinol and it's, that has shown promise uh, preclinically. So this is a xanthine oxidase inhibitor, which reduces free radical production. And once again, it's shown benefit for HIE in animal models without cooling and with cooling, but it has to be initiated early, either just before injury or just after, which uh, there's a feasibility issue there. Um, but um, there's currently a trial examining combined therapy with hypothermia. Um, but like I said, it's, it's shown benefit as a monotherapy, but importantly, it needs to be administered um, early, which makes this difficult to extrapolate to a low resource setting. But I do wanna finish by discussing um, the use of a LAM model of HIE to examine therapeutic strategies really for a low resource setting. So Emin Maltepe is a neonatologist um, here. So he and colleagues, they use a LAM model to study monotherapies that may benefit babies specifically in low resource settings. So this slide and the next slide are courtesy of Emin. In this model, so what they do is umbilical cord occlusion prior to delivery resulting in asystole. This is followed by CPR and then study drug administration. And early motor um, outcomes and PKPD sampling of the treatment in question are performed. So I'm gonna use this um, opportunity to mention azithromycin as a possible treatment option. And this is just one of the things that they're studying in the lab. So azithromycin, it's a widely used antibiotic, but of interest here, it has well-defined anti-inflammatory properties. And it may modulate the phenotype of myeloid lineage cells that play a critical role in injury progression. So John Barks' lab at the University of Michigan has shown improved outcomes in small animal models of HIE as a monotherapy. And like allopurinol and melatonin, it crosses the placenta. And so the thought is it could be given to some mothers prenatally who are at risk for a complicated delivery, although that is really difficult to determine. But so Emmons group is examining this in different dosing regimens in his LAM HIE model. So um, uh, since I have a minute, I wanna mention uh, another thing. So at PAS last month, there were also a number of abstracts looking at different combination strategies. So for example, combining EPO and azithromycin in a ferret model of premature injury, or combining EPO and melatonin for a mouse opiate injury model. In addition, Nikki Robertson's group is examining early melatonin followed by later EPO as a treatment strategy. Okay, I covered a lot of things in this talk, so I'm gonna summarize it here. Um, really, my conclusion is that uh, research is hard, essentially. <laughs> there are many steps from translating findings from bench to bedside. And it's really critical to determine reproducibility, study in multiple species, both small and large animal models. And you have to do an effectively powered phase three trial to determine efficacy and confirm safety. Now this next point, it, it may, once again, it may be obvious, but theoretical benefit does not imply actual benefit. Just because one therapy works and another works doesn't mean combining them will have an additive effect. And there's definitely a time and dose sensitivity that affects the long-term response or outcomes. And so we also need to wait for trials to be completed before adopting these treatment strategies. Um, but, you know, I, I am hopeful. You know, in the end, 
we, we need to find a therapeutic strategy that really may be a combination of optimizing our supportive care and giving time-specific interventions that are really determined by the underlying cause um, and the specifics of that patient situation. And I think working together, we can get adequate evidence and numbers to determine the best way forward. So I'd like to thank all the members of the lab, as well as my lab mentors and collaborators that did all the important animal work, as well as everyone in the HEAL consortium, specifically Yvonne Wu and Sunny Jewell as the PIs that made this happen. Okay, thank you. Thanks so much, Fernando, for this uh, really great talk and uh, clearly a lot of work and a lot of complicated work um, and uh, um, clearly also some some disappointments along the way, but I uh, do see how you stay optimistic and, and move forward uh, with this work. There's a couple of questions on the Q&A and um, if more questions come up for the audience, please type them in the Q&A. Uh, so Jim Patbury says stem cell models show very low engraftment despite effect in studies of MSCs for chronic lung disease exosomes have been shown to be equally effective exosomes would abrogate immunogenicity problems do you have any thoughts on this. Yeah, so I, I did very briefly mention it but exactly so exosomes are very. Um, a hot topic and people are, are, are studying that so really ex exactly that the idea is that the it's really the. Uh, the secreted factors from the MSC, including the exosomes, really underlie that beneficial effect. And so um, I can't, you know, they do show promise. And in the end, that might be our treatment strategy. One thing that's tricky, I don't want to get bogged down in the uh, in the weeds here. When we talk about stem cells, especially autologous stems, you know, harv you know, harvesting and processing and getting them into a baby quickly is difficult. If you could have some other things more off the shelf, um, type products that might be more feasible in different environments. So, but yes, really exosomes have shown a lot of promise and maybe they're gonna have the same benefit that MSCs do. And then uh, Alma Martinez has a question. Any insight into why hypothermia and the helix study resulted in worse outcomes? Yeah, that's an excellent question. I, the short answer is I, I do not know. Um, like I said, all those studies to optimize cooling show how important it is to do it right. You know, there's just very little wiggle room. And if you're too high or too low, that those babies do worse. And so I can suspect that maybe, you know, they even use similar cooling blankets. It was an early generation, but to what we use here. So, and these are hospitals where when you look at them, I mean, I'm not too familiar, but they could do everything that we could do. It wasn't, you know, when I say low resource, it's still, you know, fully functioning units. So I, it is very surprising the finding. So I don't know. I would suspect that maybe there was some intricacy with how the cooling was performed or the core temperature was monitored. Like that, that is super critical. Um, but I, I don't know the answer to that. Um. And then Betsy Crouch says, hi, Fernando, great talk, especially your insight into the journey from bench discovery to beneficial therapies. You mentioned potential biomarkers for HIE. What are these and which do you think are most promising? So uh, I'm going to defer that. So so right now, you know, as part of the HEAL trial, we're examining that specifically. And there, I can't say anything other than there's been some very interesting findings. So Biomarkers are very tough. So when we talk about serum biomarkers, for example, there's a lot of the, you know, maybe the adult literature and traumatic brain injury, like S100 beta and maybe GFAP and these other markers, you know, and are they elevated in neonates? Yes, to some degree, but it's really hard. You know, the holy grail is finding something that you can draw early on and say, oh yes, this baby has injury, or this baby doesn't, or this baby's gonna benefit from therapy. Um, and I don't know that we're ever gonna get that, but we're looking at many different things in the in our HEHO cohort because we collected a lot of blood and a lot of urine at different time points before and after treatment. Um, so other than to say that there's some very interesting early findings that hopefully will come out later this year, but I, uh, because the analysis is ongoing, I can't be more specific than that. Um, and then Brian Feldman says, many of us don't consider MSC stem cells. Do you have any thoughts on the use of NSCs uh, as they're being studied in adult CNS? Excellent question. Y correct. And, you know, in fact, yeah, MSC is more of a stromal. Yeah, exactly. And that's why I didn't, I didn't want to get, 
I didn't, I didn't want to harp on it and bog down and I just kind of showed, hey, look, people are studying a lot of different types of cells. The reality is we don't know, you know, MSCs are easy, is, that's an advantage. Um, and, but also it even depends on the source of the MSCs. Um, NSCs, so neuronal stem cells, so definitely have shown promise and those are being studied as well. So correct, there's many different types of cells. So really the source of the cells and, and how they're administered will, may have an impact. It's sometimes when you're comparing these studies, it's a little bit because there's different cells with different root administration and different, different amount of cells, the different timing, sometimes it's a little bit apples and oranges. There are some groups that are just comparing different cell types. Um, directly um, in administering for, for injury models. But once again, these are in small animal models. So yes, NSCs have shown promise as well. I don't see any other questions. I can um, maybe ask one myself. Um, mm -hmm. So whenever there's like animal data that don't translate as beautifully to human data, um, I often wonder, whether we actually um, have an oversimplified concept of the human disease as one entity versus maybe different pathways. To what degree do you think that that applies to your work? I told, that's an excellent point. A absolutely, it applies. And so, you know, um, you know, Mercedes Paredes gave a great grand rounds a month or two ago on about, which is about normal brain development, but really how different even that, you know, when we talk about these, you know, I talk about sheep or, piglet, you know, ferret has shown a lot of promise because the brains are, you know, more similar to humans, but still it's a different, it's a different brain. It's a different process. And I even talked about how in the classic Venucci model, there's permanent ligation and then there's a delay and then there's hypoxia. Like that's not what's happening in a, in a human neonate, right? So, you know, we we do our best with the models that we have, but that's why it's so important to test in, in many models, in many different labs to show consistency. Um, with different types of injury, because it, you know, like I said, to some degree, it may be apples and oranges, but but it's sort of the best we have. Thanks so much. Um, mm -hmm. I think that it's it for Q and A. Um, thanks, everybody. Um, Dr. Hurst, do you want to? Yes, wonderful work, uh, Fernando. That was really compelling and exciting. Want to thank you for presenting that and congratulate you. And uh, thank everybody for participating today and we'll see you at the next Grand Rounds.